What's up, everybody? The next screening of Left at Wall is June 8th in Idlewild, California. That's June 8th, Idlewild, California. We're going to do a short stand-up show, a screening of the film, and a Q&A after with myself and members of the cast. Get tickets and all information at romplacone.com. That's Idlewild, California, June 8th. See you there. Episode 32, Chris Lee. Chris Lee is an author and historian. I've always been interested in the connection between politics and football, a.k.a. soccer, especially in Italy. It came up some in episode 27 with Attila the stockbroker. Well, I decided why not talk to someone who wrote a book on the topic. Chris Lee, among other things, is the author of The Defiant, A History of Football Against Fascism. He dives into that history not just in Italy, but other countries as well. This episode is almost more like a history lesson than an interview, and I mean that in a good way. Please welcome to the show, Chris Lee. So, Chris Lee, thank you so much for being here. Good to connect with you. Likewise. Thanks for having me on. So, before we get into kind of the meat of the topic itself, I, I wanted to start a little bit about you. Um, what got you interested in politics and football? What made you mm-hmm. want to become a historian in that space? Yeah, I mean, just for context, my day job is I actually work in PR and digital marketing. <laughs> but back in the day, I um, did a dissertation in a uh, European studies degree. So both in the UK and a place called Coventry and a year in Madrid. And watching soccer in the UK is largely apolitical. So there's no kind of real sociology to it outside of, of probably the Glasgow Derby in Scotland, uh, of Rangers and Celtic, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners will be familiar with. And we may well touch on it at some point. But um, because I had a politics degree, I went to Madrid and Spain where it was very I mean, regional identity is a really strong thing, and the way it's expressed is through often through the national sport, um, which is soccer or football. Um, and so I did uh, my dissertation was ten thousand words, which was quite a sizable chunk of my degree um, <laughs> of the final score. I did it on um, football and regional identity in Spain expressed. Sorry, start again. It's a uh, Regional identity in Spain is expressed through football, that's it. And a case study of, of Real Madrid and FC Barcelona. So this was in the 90s, late 90s. There wasn't really anything in English about it, apart from Simon Cooper's book, Football Against the Enemy, which is the only first book that really in English that touches on um, soccer as a political sort of tool. Um, football publishing itself wasn't really that much of a thing. I think Fever Pitch came out in, what, 1991? So it was quite, Nick Hornby, that was quite groundbreaking. It's the first book that really made football a serious topic really in many ways uh, mainstream at least um so and then i guess i'd parked that for a long time i found myself ground hopping a lot with 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 work and ground hopping by the way just those not familiar with this basically you're not necessarily tied to go to any one particular stadium to watch any one particular team you like seeing taking games in wherever you are so obviously i took a load in in spain when i was a student and when i was abroad like lived in australia played in in uh, you know amateur leagues in australia um, and also, um, whenever I was say in Europe, mainland Europe, with with work, I would go like, I'm in Amsterdam, I'm going to see Ajax. Um, I'll, I'll see that Royal Antwerp at home tomorrow over in Belgium. They're only a like 90 minute train ride away. I'd go and watch Royal Antwerp. So um, that's kind of what got me into. It. And then I started chronicling it. Um, realised there's a big community of other people out there. Um, set up Outside Right, which is my blog. Uh, added a podcast to that. Um, and then added two books since then, which is the first one was Origin Stories, the Pioneers Who Took Football to the World. That came out in almost three, three years ago this month, actually, in April 2021. Uh, and I followed up with um, The Define the History of Football Against Fascism, which came out in October 2022. And I've got a third one coming out next year. And I've been kind of teasing it out, but that's more or less me looking around Irish football. So um, League of Ireland and the Irish League. So um, in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, lots of politics, and lots of amazing stadiums as well. So um, that one to look out for. So I, I know this isn't necessarily uh, a question that could be answered uh, briefly, but, but mm. uh, you know, I'll have to ask you for the Cliff Notes version. So what is the history of politics and football mm. in Europe? How did they merge? Oh, it's been there since the beginning really if i if i if we assume the sort of year zero of um 
the association rule book is when it comes out because obviously lots of codes of football um in um in, in before the association rule book came out which is what we'd call soccer now right 1863 a group of clubs got together in in london um and the i guess you know it was sociological in in england and, and scotland when it arrived there um and it didn't really get political so i guess it went to ireland and it became a sort of there was quite often a because it was um an issue between imported games and people who wanted to protect um um actual irish games like hurling and and gaelic football and that's sort of Kind of 1884, the Gaelic Athletic Association was set up, and there was often quite a bit of rancor between the two as to like, you know, whether or not you were allowed to play soccer as well. Um, and then it does, it gets as it becomes part of national awakening. Soccer becomes part of national identity in places like Uruguay and Argentina, who are relatively new countries at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the sort of criollos, as they're known, the, the sort of like local-born people, use often of Italian or Spanish descent, take the game over from. The English, the Scottish, the Germans, who traditionally, you know, ran the game from, you know, the the, the gentleman class, I should say, the the kind of elite business people, um, and it came to, comes the game of the people, I guess, in there and a lot of other places. It's part of the national awakening in Turkey in the twenties, um, Egypt, as well as a sort of anti-colonial force, likewise in India, um, and then um, I guess the first person to really politicise football was. Um, Benito Mussolini, the dictator of Italy, uh, from 1922 on till 1943. Although he had sort of hang off in parts of Italy, in northern Italy, till 1945, when he was um, killed. So yeah, I mean, that's I'm sure we're going to delve into that because the the legacy of Mussolini's kind of um, impact on football still resonates really um, within Italy today. Well, yeah. That let's, sorry, wasn't uh, a short answer, was it? Sorry. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I short as in like you know, I, I, I know that books have been written on the topic, so it's like, how can you summarize it? But um, uh, yeah, I want to dive into some of the Italy stuff because the way, so the way I became cognizant of all of this, aside from just you know enjoying this the game, is uh, you know, I have family over in Italy. And being American, I, I didn't know about any of this stuff. But um, on my second trip to Italy, I acquired an AC Milan jersey. And the only reason AC Milan was a team that I liked was because they were one of the only soccer teams I got to watch being in mm-hmm. the United States. One of the only Italian soccer teams. So it was basically you could see Liverpool, Manchester, AC Milan, Roma. That was about it. Uh, so, uh, I mean, unless you had a a special, I mean, now I'm able to get all of Napoli's games and stuff like that, but this was some time ago. And, um, so I was wearing an AC Milan Jersey and my Italian cousins asked me, cause it it was Berlusconi's team at the time. So my Italian cousins asked me if I liked Bush and I (laughs) didn't understand the connection between, I thought they were just randomly asking me and I said, no. Uh, And they were like, well, then why are you wearing that shirt? And I was very confused by the follow-up question. (laughs) Like, it didn't make any sense to me. Um, Mm. And then my cousin explained all of that to me. And, you know, like, 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 or at least gave me kind of the cliff notes about right-wing team and left-wing teams. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, Mm. And then he asked me about American football. And he said, well, is such and such a Republican team or a Democrat team? And I said, we don't really have that. That's not a thing i mean Mm. i guess one could make the argue argument that all uh, american football is kind of right wing uh you know due to like the the hyper militarization of it all because they you know but that's a whole other can of worms for a different day but Mm. um so that's how i got into all of it chris and 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 so Mm. so what is kind of the history in in regards to italy yeah, I mean, were, were your cousins from the south? Were they from Na- Napoli, Naples? Originally, but they they live right. in the north now. Uh, Napoli well, is the, my family team, right? Because you will probably know that there's a huge north south thing also in Italy, just geographically, economically, and Naples will always say that they've been kind of looked down on by the north. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, Milan being one of the, the key centers of that, um, and Diego Maradona in the 1990 World Cup semi-final, which was held in Naples, um, 
quite famously because he was playing for them at the time, delivered two titles for them uh, for Napoli. He, you know, said to the Neapolitans, you know, who are you going to support tonight? Are you going to support Italy? <laughs> or are you going to support like me and obviously Argentina? And um, there's obviously a huge connection anyway between Argentina and Italy. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's it, that was quite interesting. Obviously, um, as you know, uh, Italy kind of were nailed on to win that home tournament. And of course, they lost that semi final in the penalty shootout. Um, Maradona went on to lose the final. But um, still, it was, um, yeah, there's, there is that north south thing. But it, if we draw, dial back to the 20s, um, so Mussolini comes in, he doesn't even like football, but he understands that, uh, and Italy isn't particularly good at it, by the way, at this point, but he understands it, political potential as a unifying force. So Italy was found, founded by a thing called the Risorgimento in 1861. A guy called Garibaldi drove that. I'm sure everyone's heard of Giuseppe Garibaldi. He, um, and so basically there was lots and lots of city, city states almost, and this does come back to the, to the current sort of mindset of the Campanile, which is the bell tower, as you know. So people are fiercely loyal towards their local um, club and their local province. Um, where So he mostly saw football as a way of uniting that. So uh, of the countries, he, he said something along the lines of, we have made Italy, now we must make Italians. Um, so in the 20s, he was on the mission to do that. There's a thing called the Carta di Viareggio, which was the, the Charter of Viareggio, which is a town on the West Coast, um, where they got together and said, right, this is the, blueprint for the future of Italian football. They founded Serie A, which is the, the league. Um, they found it, well, they rebooted the Coppa Italia as a nationals competition. So they wanted representation from everywhere. And you mentioned AS Roma recently in, the, in your podcast with um, Attila, the stockbroker, the mm-hmm. team from Rome. They were founded um, as a fascist project in many ways because they were three teams. He wanted one team, one strong team in Rome uh, to represent the capital. Um, there are three teams that did merge to form AS Roma, and there's one team that refused to join, which was Lazio, which um, you know you mentioned uh, on your podcast there as well. They now have a really fierce Rome derby. They met this weekend at the time we're recording, actually, um, and that you know, has a political edge, but it kind of like you know uh, I won't go into that just now. They also fo- founded AS, uh, AC Fiorentina, which is um, from from Florence. They wanted out of two clubs because they wanted one strong Florentine team. Um, he anglicized a lot of the names that, sorry, Italianized a lot of the English sounding names, a lot of Anglo founded clubs like Genoa, um, like Milan, actually Milan cricket and football club, as it was used to be known, um, that had to be changed from Milan, which is the English word for Milan to Milano. Uh, likewise, Internazionale, who is the inter, the big rivals of Milan, they were Swiss founded. Obviously they got an international name and he didn't like that either. So he, he changed that to Abrosiana, which is the, after the, um, I think the saint of uh, Milan, Milan is in Santa Ambrose. So it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of identity that goes into Italian football right from the off, you know, in the 1920s this year. Um, so invest in Stadia. Um, there's a member of his his kind of political wing pretty much everywhere uh, involved in the um, Olympic Committee as well as the FA, and they win the right to host the 1934 World Cup. Um, there's lots of rumours about how um, Italy came to win that, but they did. And um, the just to show how it wasn't really in the, the national sport at this point, it wasn't his priority. He didn't turn up to the after party, apparently. Um, and he created a trophy to give to the winning Italian team that was much bigger than the Jewelry May trophy, which was what they were given at the time for winning the World Cup. Um, so he saw the propaganda value, and Italy did win the amateur 1936 Berlin Olympic gold, and then they retained the World Cup in France in 1938. So there was no doubt by then that they were the, you know, at least one of the best teams. Bear in mind that the British Association, so in particular England and Scotland, who were the strong, uh, strongest at this time, um, didn't enter this competition, and neither did Uruguay, who were world champions in 1930, because they, um, a lot of European clubs didn't come down to their World Cups. They said, right, we're not coming out to yours. So um, the it's actually, um, it, you know, there's a bit of an asterisk around Italy as whether where they were kind of the best team in the world at that point. England did beat them. At, it was the, you know, the infamous Battle of Highbury in 1935. Highbury, Arsenal's old ground in London. Um, but for the Italians, it was a moral victory because they were down to 10 men very early on due to an injury and didn't have substitutes in those days. So... Um, that was highly political and politicized as well at international level. 
by the 1938 World Cup, Italy is actually involved in the Spanish Civil War. Um, their fighters and bombers are involved in, say, the, the bombing of Guernica, which you might be familiar with. Um, uh, Pablo Picasso made a big artwork about it. It's a big sort of anti-war protest. Um, and so it's one of the first civilian bombings. So they're involved there. So by the time they come to France for that 1938 World Cup, the um, there's a big Italian diaspora who's anti-Mussolini. There's a big Spanish diaspora in France that's escaping the Spanish Civil War across the Pyrenees. And so, yeah, the, this World Cup becomes highly political as well in an anti-Mussolini way. So you get lots of chanting. Um, they are holding the Roman salute as the right arm aloft at this point. In the first match, they're getting booed in Marseille. And uh, the coach is a guy called Vittorio Bozzo, who's the only guy to have won the World Cup twice as a manager, 34 and 38. He, after the booing dies down, he orders his team to hold that salute again <laughs> so that they, you know, just show that we're not intimidated type thing. Um, so, yeah, it was very political, those two World Cups um, involving Italy in the 1930s. And it's a highly politicised era, really. Uh, also in 1938, you have England going to um, Berlin and playing Germany, um, then was Nazi Germany, and they're obviously trying to appease Adolf Hitler and keep out of trouble, even though he's kind of invading Czechoslovakia and um, annexing Austria and stuff and making noises about, you know, Poland and things. And um, the England team um, shamefully hold the salute at that point, just to sort of for politics. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a highly politicized era at that, that time. And that kind of is when football really, you know, football and politics really just mix. And we, whenever we say, oh, we don't, we oh, didn't mix. And it's like, um, you know, it shouldn't mix. And it always does. And even, you know, at a big level like that, international level, sport, uh, local, regional level, um, either as part of our identity or also because it's the most popular sport and also even a micro level. So I was speaking to a, a Scottish guy the other day and, you know, he said, whoever you support is going to be a bit of a political act. He's a Celtic fan and a Scotland fan. So he's, you know, he probably supports whoever's playing against England and, and that he may, sit and, may not view it like that, but is a, is a political act in, in a way, you know, whoever you're supporting and you'll support anyone who plays against Rangers likewise. So, um, you know, in these little micro personal ma ways, we are committing politics, I suppose, when we, you know, by who we support and then, um, you know, but it does translate at an international level. So it's massive in the 30s, but it's massive now. Look at the, you know, the, the fuss that's made every time that it's, it's held at, you know, wherever the tournament's being held there, that host is, is, is um, scrutinised, especially with, like, you know, obviously Qatar, Russia recently, the World Cups. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's you know, Argentina 1978, infamously under a military dictatorship that still went ahead. So it's, it's, it's in, it's always interesting. There's never a dull moment really for football and politics. So, so when did kind of football against fascism, like, like is its mm. roots with anti Mussolini or, or, or how did that evolve? Yeah. I mean, Mussolini was the first fascist leader. So he kind of, I would say invented fascism, but he was like, it, it's, um, he certainly set a mold for certain European leaders in the 20th century. Um, and far right ones in South America in the 60s onwards. But the, um, I'd say as soon as he came in, obviously he had his opponents. And, but like I said, football wasn't super huge in Italy until it got really good in the late 20s, early 30s. Um, so at this point, it was very difficult to show any kind of dissent at home without getting arrested. Um, the you see little things like there's a great case of a guy called Bruno Neri who was a Fiorentina player. Um, and there's a wonderful photo in the nine, 1931, I think it is, when uh, Fiorentina's new stadium is being built, the um, what is now known as the Artemio Franchi. Um, it, it all the players are up, uh, they're playing a team from Vienna called Admira, and um, the all the team are doing the Roman salute apart from him, so he's doing this little one man act of defiance effectively. Um, he was kind of like his career potential him and other players were kind of curtailed by that act. Um, he ended up um, playing for a team called Lucchese down in Luca, which is um, also t in Tuscany, but the um, where they were managed by a um, Jewish Hungarian called Egri Erbstein, who has was allowed to, I mean, I think foreign coaches were allowed, but foreign players weren't unless you were of Italian descent in those days. So, um, so he ended up there like a lot of other players did in the third division, effectively. Um, but it's quite interesting because he then went on to fight Mussolini as a partisan, you know, in the foothills around Italy and, and stuff in, the, in in World War Two, and actually was shot. Um, I think he was protecting his friends, like just like 
trying to um, create cover for them to escape and he did that so he kind of died in a very heroic manner um for what he believed in so it's quite um that's quite interesting but there yeah so that's where it sort of kicks off in a sort of small way in the in the in the 30s well so is that how because it's still sort of a little bit of a mystery to me like, like kind of moving on to to sort of more present day like how is a team a right wing team or mm. a left wing team like 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 is it just based on the ownership or is it like and i know some of them have histories like how did fc st pauli become mm. fc st pauli how is livorno like the main left i mean i know obviously the history of the communist party in italy has to have mm. something to do with that but how did it remain in the football club for all these years like are there just some explanations of for that or is it just something that gets passed down um since you i mean some most of it's usually not the ownership just so clear it's like usually the fans um okay so you get a reputation because sometimes it's both um but in the case of i mean just you mentioned St. Pauli there uh in hamburg they oh that was a fan-led thing very much um back in the sort of late 70s early 80s there was a lot of some it's it's in the sort of Reaper Barn area of uh, of, um, of Hamburg, the port area. So it's always been a bit, um, you know, they've they've had their social challenges around there, should we say? And there was a lot of squatters and things like that. And they, they found it was formed by a lot of guys who'd gone into uh, highest Val Hamburg as well, which is the other big team in Hamburg. And they'd seen a lot of right wing activity in the Curva and they, the Tribuna, as they've known the, the stands. And they thought, like, you know, we don't like this. Let's do our own thing, our, our left wing anti fascist thing over over at St. Pauli. And they kind of like took over the, the tribuna there and um the so that's kind of how the St. Pauli thing happened. It's quite interesting that they like Livorno, as you mentioned, has it, got a communist history anyway. Um so some curva can uh, curva being the Italian word for the sort of end stand the curve effectively literally. So so in Italy they're highly politicized. Sometimes you have a right wing one, sometimes you have a left wing one. And some yeah you know, sometimes often at the same club you can uh, uh, you can have different political persuasions even within the same curva so it's kind of like it's it's often quite often the way but in italy there's far more right-wing ones than left-wing ones but the interesting thing about san paolo is it's kind of become part of its brand over the years um mm-hmm. you know even before the internet um it was like word of mouth people would go to europe do some ground hopping and go like, i've just seen this phenomenal experience at, at uh, san paolo i really like what they sort of you know believe in and let's recreate that here and so you get a sort of rise of left-wing ultras in the 80s at places like Rio Vallecano in uh, in the 90s as well in Madrid they're like at the working class uh, area of Vallecas south of kind of the south of the city um Cadiz or Cadiz down in the south of Spain they've got Brigadas Amarillas the yellow brigade uh they are also quite left-wing in Spain um again Probably, if they are political in Spain, it's often quite conservative um, or right wing curva. Um, the um, and then obviously there's other clubs that have taken inspiration from it. I think you've mentioned Portland Timbers in America, right? Yeah. Um, and then there also in Ireland in Dublin, there's a couple of Bohemians, which one of the oldest clubs in Dublin. They were founded in 1890. They've always had a fan. Um, they've always been fan owned one of the few five, I think there's five clubs left in the Republic of Ireland that are fan owned. Um, and they are one of them. And they're, so they've always had that sort of, you know, that ethos, but they're very much political in a non-political league in that they're kind of, you know, doing refugees welcome and things that are like homeless, uh, things for homeless people, prisoners, things like that. So it's kind of, it's very charitable, almost sort of, you know, the way that it, it uh, behaves and it gives space in its away show in particular for um for kind of creativity almost you know um so there's them then in the english non-league it's quite interesting as well because as i mentioned before football in england certainly not so much scotland but in england it's very apolitical mostly apart from the liverpool's had its moments um because of you know the circumstances around it it's individually and the city so but on the whole it's pretty apolitical, um, except at lower league level, people who have been to places like St. Pauli, places like Rayo Vallecano, like Livorno, have come back and said, we've seen this amazing ultra culture. Um, mm-hmm. Let's recreate it. Um, the irony being that ultra culture actually originally came from a mixture of the Brazilian 
uh, torcida scene, as it's known, um, which came in via Yugoslav fans who'd been to the 1950 World Cup in Brazil. And the, the fans have had Hajduk split in Croatia and gone, oh, I really like these guys making a lot of noise or singing or banging of drums and things. Let's, let's do that here. And then it sort of mixed with the English, what was then the hooligan um, culture in the 60s and 70s and 80s, which was really just kind of there's no, pol- mostly not political, well, there was a bit of right wing act bits and bobs in it, but mostly just like violence. And that in Italy, they kind of merged the two. <laughs> you had the ultra culture of the mixture of the Tosito and the Hooligan. So it's quite interesting um, how that came about. Um, but yeah, in the lower in- in English league, they've taken the, the friendlier elements of the St. Pauli um, style um, and created quite a left-leaning kind of experience of places like Clapton, which is a community club in East London, um, Dulwich Hamlet in South London, which used to be my local club. Um, and they're getting 3,500 people in a seventh tier um, you know, match, and that's unheard of. That's like 10 times what you would expect to get at that level, pretty much. Um, or maybe not that much, maybe eight times. And um, yeah, so, and, and Whitehawk in Brighton, it's, it's, which is, a, you know, another sort of little community club that's doing a lot of, you know, left, it's quite left wing. So it's sort of catching up this, um, catching on everywhere, really, just sort of like these little communities. And it's, it's quite, I, I quite like it. It's quite interesting. But um, like, so I don't know, when you talk about like the culture of it, um, at that level, you're not really signaling to anyone or getting much attention outside of whoever's in the ground, right? So you only sort of do it to yourself and the way, you know, the few away fans that to say like, you know, this is what we're about. This is what we believe in. Um, you know, it's not really until you get on television and with a global audience, that you can actually sort of make that politics more widely visible, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, going back to Italy for a bit, Someone like Maradona, you know, like like mm. when I go to, you know, I, I have family in Napoli and, mm. and then I have family who is also originally from Napoli, but ended up going up north for, um, I think, mostly like work related reasons. Yeah, they ended up up north. But um, but you see him everywhere. And, mm. you know, you, he was also just a well-known communist. And so, so is that something that is, is sort of just universally known and celebrated? Because like sometimes you'll see that mentioned in monuments of him. Other times, you know, it's not mentioned. He was just a great football player. So, and, and even having spent time in Napoli myself, I, I don't really know the answer to that question. So, yeah, I mean, on the uh, Maradona thing within Na- uh, Napoli itself, um, I guess he won their first titles first two times there were two champions at the moment at the time that we're speaking um mm-hmm. but it's a very different era um they've been an established tough for a long time they've obviously had the the success before maradona was the you know he wasn't expected to come there they were you know he'd left barcelona under a bit of a cloud um you know he was the best player in the world at the time uh certainly up there i think 86 would have cemented him as the best player but before that obviously he had players like um platini socrates zico you know the other great players at the time um um, but to have, it was a massive coup to get him to play for, for Napoli, and he stayed there for four years, which was quite, you know, quite quite a long time. Um, so yes, he's iconised there. He's kind of politically stuck it to the north. They were the first Southern club to win the title. Um, if you count Rome as a kind of part of the north, it's the capital, so I suppose it's kind of like that. But the south, mm-hmm. it's you know, as you know, it's the south of Italy is very different from the north, uh, and especially so in the eighties. And so they feel that they were looked down on. I think we alluded to this with the Argentina 1990 match there uh, earlier. So he was a massive hero from that point of view. And he's got, as you mentioned, all those murals, the massive mural. In, um, in If you go to the um, Spanish quarters, you know, the Quartieri Spagnoli uh, in, in Naples, it's just phenomenal. You see him everywhere, don't you? It's <laughs> like on the street corner, um, just little graffito of, 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 of Maradona here and there. But I think also that Naples kind of, he's from, he's he's known as the Pibe de Barrio, the street the street boy of gold, uh, golden boy, effectively, um, in Argentina. It's kind of like this mythical figure, the boy that makes good, you know, from the street. And I think there's probably a lot, quite a bit of similarity, if you don't mind me saying, from between Naples and Buenos Aires in terms of possibly financial outlook obviously um aesthetically similar looking sort of 
um, buildings, obviously no massive volcano in, in the backdrop in, in Buenos Aires, but you know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's got that. And also, um, you know, obviously there's a big, like I said, Italian connection, a lot of whom are from the South. Although um, a lot of the people that founded um, Boca Juniors, for example, were from Genoa, actually, uh, Chinezes, as they know down there, um, the Genoese. So there is that kind of connection, I think, al- already between Latin America, especially Argentina, and Napoli as a place. And I think that he kind of also helped the fact that he kind of stuck it to the north, bought them that title, and um, and in him they found kind of like a hero. And this speaks to the, the whole thing about politics and football. It's like, how can we – it's like a level playing field, basically, for if you, even if you're economically or socially from different – strata to the people that you're playing against um it's the level playing field and he kind of you know leveled it for them effectively by sticking it to the north and bringing the title to napoli Mm -hmm. so you uh in our written correspondence you used a term i was not familiar with so so i i I just want to you know uh, clarify this what is campanilismo Campanilismo is the um, loyalty to the campanile, the bell tower. So it's a phenomenon in Italy where you're f- very loyal to your local um, region almost. Um, and also you're, you know, even within a region such as Tuscany, um, you can have intense rivalry between Livorno and Pisa, for example, both mm. Tuscan cities, um, but both fierce rivals. There, you know, so there's no like, oh, we're Tuscan, let's, you know, let's get on. Um but um, you know, it's, that's why people are quite fiercely. I mean, that's why it's been very difficult. As part of what Muslim was about was trying to create that sort of um, unifying um, element, really, to Italy through football. Um, which, because of this regional thing, because obviously, as you know, there's huge dialect differences as well. Uh, yes. I think the Italian. Yeah, whenever was... we're we're taught the Florentine dialect, so for yeah. me, when I and and I'm I'm not fluent, but I'm but I'm conversational. I I do okay when I'm over there, and uh, but when I go down to Napoli, it, it's it's humbling because <laughs> I, I just really yeah. struggle. <laughs> And then uh, native Italians will say things like, oh, yeah, we struggle, too. It's a, And I think they're just being polite. I, I think they're just mm. trying to make me feel better about myself. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I think they're no, just there, being polite. There is a huge, huge dialect thing. Like you said, you mentioned the standard Italian we'll speak was based kind of on the Florentine thing, which I think only a handful of percent of the population actually spoke at the time of the 1860s or whenever. Um, you've got like Sardinian, obviously, a completely different language and, um, you know, different dialects in the south uh, and yeah you said yeah, I, I speak conversational italian but i struggled in naples i said it's just like like especially a football match <laughs> so i obviously went to napoli and i went to another great place down the coast by when you're next there if you head towards um a place called castello mari um Distabia. so it's on the way it's just between um pompeii and uh sorrento it's um it's a club called juve stabia which is um beautiful setting amongst these kind of stone pines in a classic Italian setting really with the mountains behind it and Vesuvius so um, I went up Vesuvius in the morning came down watched some soccer at um, Juve Stabia in the afternoon it was brilliant oh, um, but yeah it's totally different And but this this goes back to what I'm saying before it's like highly regionalised there and it's the same in Spain where um, the you know you've got the Catalan region you've got Madrid the centre you've got which is the capital so if you'd like to kick against that um, you've got Athletic Club de Bilbao, who just won the Copa del Rey this weekend at the time we were recording um, for their first trophy for 40 years. They're, you know, a huge standard bearer for for Basque country. They only play Basque players or players with Basque heritage. Um, unlike their rivals, Real Sociedad, who are just out from down the road there in San Sebastian, they, they will take foreign players, but they also develop a lot of local talent as well. So it's kind of highly regionalised in in those places a lot more than, than other places within um, within Europe. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, the, then you also have the Roman dialect, which is also mm. kind of its own. Uh, I, I don't know if you are you familiar with Cyril Kalkare, the cartoonist? No. So he, he has a couple series on Netflix. Like he was he was a comic book artist that got picked up by Netflix. And uh, you can watch and they have English translations, but he speaks he typically speaks a really thick Roman dialect. And there's this, Mm. um, I haven't seen this video, but allegedly it's out there where he has a translator 
who's uh, I think it was German. He it was with a German outlet. So he had this Italian translator who was going to listen to him and then speak it back in German. And he had such a thick Roman dialect that the translator was like, hold on, I'm going to need to ask him to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> the translator like but uh, i haven't seen that video but but uh, apparently it's out there so um right. well let me ask you is it interesting to you how it's finally sort of coming over to the united states like i, I know we talked about hmm. portland and then i also mentioned to you you know so in the u.s we have the mls and then we have uh, a league below that called uh united league soccer and the team that I like is a team called the Pittsburgh River Hounds. Pittsburgh is my hometown. I, I live in Los Angeles now, but Pittsburgh's my hometown. And they kind of have a little bit. I mean, when you look at their their fan section, you see like anti-racist logos and flags and you see rainbow flags. And so I, I don't think it's like super like huge but but there's a little bit of that going on there and mm. my best guess is because of you know fans looking at something like St. Pauli and and wanting to create it like you mentioned mm. yeah it could be i mean um the good thing about this is also it adds a positive kind of atmosphere right as well mm -hmm. you know if it's a friendly ultra <laughs> as i should say sure. um question is for that i mean it's interesting like i said uh, Obviously, soccer's taking up, and I guess um, when soccer first got big in America in the 1920s, uh, and it almost, you know, had a really good league in didn't it, the American Soccer League, and then it kind of fizzled out after the the, the 1930 um, stock market crash and things, uh, Wall Street crash. Um, but it, that was sort of based on a lot of, of of migrant communities at the time, so Scottish players, Irish players, English players, Portuguese players as well, actually. Um, um, and I guess now. That sort of the changing demographics of the United States is free soccer based players, right? A lot of um, you know, Latin American piece of players with Latin American um, or fans with Latin American background, maybe um, kind of as well as people who um, who enjoy watching European football as well. Um, and so they've probably seen that influence on television. Um, what intrigues me is that the the St. Paulification, or if you want to call it that, if that's a thing, uh, of, of football isn't. It's it's quite word of internet if, if you know what I mean it's not like yeah. if you watch the major leagues like the Premier League or La Liga in Spain you don't necessarily see that kind of activity whereas you would if you you know followed club on the internet or on YouTube, uh, you know, on YouTube or Instagram or something like that or you'd actually gone to Germany and watched St Pauli yourself um, and so it's intriguing how it got there and who it's influencing and how to what extent is it infusing I mean. Is it just like a few people with one big flag or is it like the whole stadium getting involved? Do you know what I mean? For St. Pauli, it's kind of become a bit of an ethos, a bit of a, you know, if I walk down the street with my St. Pauli t-shirt on and I see someone walking the same way with another St. Pauli t-shirt, we kind of exchange knowing glances. We know, we know, yeah. we know why we do, what do we support the brand or do you support the club? You know what I mean? So I don't know right. where they are in the five Bundesliga right now. Uh, you know, the, the second German division, I, um, but I know what they stand for, and I quite I'm quite down with that. Yeah, I mean, here in the U.S., because there's like a St. Pauli club in Los Angeles, mm. and, and I would say that that for the most part here in the U.S., it would just be assumed like, like it's not uncommon to see a St. Pauli logo like along with like an anti-fascist logo. Mm. Like that's pretty common, and I I saw that out in uh, Japan actually. I was I was in Tokyo, and I, I went to. Mm -hmm kind of like a lefty punk bar and there was a St. Mm. Pauli logo there uh, mm. along with other things. So, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it's just, uh, it's always been a very fascinating topic to me. And, and now that it, it seems to be seeping into the United States for, to the best of my knowledge, the first time in my lifetime. Mm. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. So obviously it's not, um, I say not a massive sport. It's not one of the mainstream ones, is it? In the stage, if, no, you know, it's not like NFL or even hockey. If you're from you're from Pittsburgh, so you probably. Um, I'm a big hockey guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm a big I've been hockey there a guy. Got family in Pittsburgh, so I've been to. Do you like going to? Uh, oh, what's the stadium called now? Console Energy is the hockey one. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Console Energy. Yeah, but it's it's had a few different names. Actually, it might be different now. To tell you the truth. 
Uh, mm. I might be I might be a, a name or two ago, but um, but yeah, it, it's always changing. Uh, and then the the Steelers play at a place called, it's called like a Crisier or something like that. That they recently changed the name of that. I, I still go back and visit my family there, but uh, but yeah, I'm not always super uh, super abreast to what's going on. But um, but yeah, I mean, I I think. And this is probably a, a, a bit of a generalization, and also I'm a bit biased because I'm a you know a pretty big left wing guy myself. But but I think generally speaking, most people in the U.S. that are really into football, um, you know, football, football, soccer, um, it's either because of family history or if they just kind of came to it themselves. You know, there, there's a good chance their politics are, or you know, like center or left of center or or you know like like generally speaking because you have to seek it out a a little bit more Mm. and things like that it's not it's not mainstream and it's not you know there's a certain sort of um i don't know if worldliness is the right way to put it but 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 it's sort of it's sort of like the underrepresented thing so Mm. you know the people that migrate to it usually tend to be a bit more left-leaning no, oh, that's interesting. Um, do you know how the word soccer came about, by the way? I know the brief because it was it was soccer first, and then there was some kind of like argument, and then it was football. A- am I correct? Well, no. The, the here's the thing because I've over here in in the UK, it, people quite often take um, really don't like the word soccer um, right. when people use it. However, it's actually an English guy who came up with it. So his name was Charles Rayford Brown. He played for a, a side called the Corinthians, who were a famous touring club. They're very, you know, gentlemen, amateurs from the 1880s and 90s, and they would tour the world, like literally tour the world, like South Africa, South America, lots of Europe, United States as well, um, playing exhibition matches to kind of show how the game should be played. Um, and because it's an abbreviation of the word association uh, football, so it's the Asso- football association rules as opposed to the rugby rules, which was rugger. And so soccer, he's, uh, that's allegedly the origins of it. So I was, I mean, it's very useful as well because everyone has a code of football, which is basically just kicking a ball. So you have NFL over there. Australia has Australian rules football. Um, however, that's mostly in the state of Victoria. If I went to the next door state in New South Wales, football is rugby league, which is um, mm. a different code of rugby union. Which is, <laughs> so, And then if you go across, and rugby union is what they play in New Zealand predominantly, which they call football. So it's kind of, you know, it's, and in Ireland, they've got that Gaelic football. So actually soccer is a really, really useful term. We know what it means. It's the round ball one. You know what I mean? So it's like, actually, um, I find soccer very useful, but yeah, I don't use it in the UK. I'm happy to use it with a US, predominantly US audience, because I think we know what we're all talking about. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, well, if sometimes anyone... we just kind of have to like sometimes even if I'm talking to a person over there, I'll have because mm. if I just say football, they think I'm talking about, you know, my American football. Yeah. So I have to be like, they're like, oh, yeah, do you like the Steelers? And I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, what we call soccer. I like that. But but yeah, but if you ever hear over here and everyone, anyone has a go at you for saying soccer, then just point out it was an English guy who came up with the term anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so what do you got coming up uh, as we're closing out here? Uh, feel free to plug away any projects that you have. Oh. Uh, let people know where to find your books to, yeah. if they want to take a deeper dive into all this. Yeah, I mean, basically, um, outside, outside rights, that's W-R-I-T-E, so it's a play on words um, and a play on the number seven position on the um, – so outside right.co.uk you can follow me on social media so twitter stroke x i'll never call it x i'm always going to call it twitter uh Amen. facebook kind of instagram mostly every day um and then there's a podcast as well outside right so it comes out every two weeks again i try to get interesting guests who we're talking about travel culture and history around football so you know thinking about it the game a bit more from a social point of view so this week's podcast was for example about a guy who ground hopped every round of the fa cup from <laughs> the start which is basically like little village clubs all the way to the final which was a manchester city against manchester united you might remember said so the first ever manchester derby weird there had not been one before in the final um and then um the week before you know two weeks before that we were doing portuguese football and his- history of the guys written a book about that so there's something for everyone pretty much i, I try to keep it um really broad as much as possible um like i said i'm working on a book on irish football myself i kind of been doing some ground hopping over there recently and that will be out early next year at the moment 
Um, so look out for that. But yeah, just if you follow on social, you get all the latest. And my books, like I said, Origin Stories, The Pioneers Who Took Football to the World, was um, it's basically a chapter by chapter story of how the game got started, including chapters on in the United States, um, which is a kind of big missed opportunity. It could have been one of the big soccer playing nations, but um, uh, it didn't happen. Um, I find out why in that book. And then also uh, the Defiant, the history, uh, history of football against fashion, from, which is kind of, I think, how you found me, right? Um, yes. So that's more just about the political side, particularly a particular aspect. Well, I thought it was quite timely, and the, the book just seems to get more and more timely, weirdly. <laughs> as things well, we're, we're living through interesting times, to say the least. Oh, yeah. so. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Chris. I, I really appreciate you uh, highlighting all this stuff, and uh, I learned a lot. Thanks for having me on, Ron. That was Chris Lee. Be sure to check out all of his stuff. Music for the 1000 Podcast is provided by Andrew Saxon. Be sure to check out his podcast, The Baywatching Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I said podcast way too many times in that sentence. Leave us a five-star review, would you? And if you want to support this show on the sustainability end, you can do so over at patreon.com slash romplacone. For a give what you can level, you get all kinds of cool perks. You get full stand-up sets not available anywhere else. You get a bonus podcast between Andrew and myself. You get the episodes of 1000 before before they're released publicly and we're doing some zoom screenings of the movie left at wall that are for patrons only and we'll be doing screenings of other films and projects uh just all kinds of cool stuff it's a great community and you can become part of that for a give what you can level even a dollar a month goes a long way also another update on the show here uh somebody suggested that for the last episode of 1000 uh everybody gets to ask me questions Which is a neat sentiment, but I don't think I can do that because technically that would violate the rule. I have to interview 1,000 people, so I I cannot be one of them. But what I thought would be a cool uh, alternative situation is that at the end of each episode, I will answer a question that uh, a listener submits. So we're going to be starting that next week. And uh, the person who suggested this, uh, I'll be taking her question first. So I'll be answering the first question next week. And in the meantime, please do submit some questions and I'll be answering them at the end of each 1000 episode. So I won't answer a thousand questions, but uh, it'll be pretty close. It'll be over 900. Close enough, right? Because we're starting it now. All right. See you next week. Hey guys, Ron Placone here. Take your own 1,000 challenge. No, you don't need to interview 1,000 people, although if you want to do that, go for it. Your 1,000 challenge can be whatever you want. Maybe you want to call a friend out of the blue once a week. Maybe you want to read a book every month. Maybe you want to start a different garden every season. I guess that might be dependent on where you live. Look, the point of the challenge is taking on an endeavor that enriches your life in some way, and it can be measured. And then, of course, you do it regularly. That's what 1000 is doing for me and hopefully for you, too. The main reason for this podcast and every podcast I've ever done is to build community. So take your own challenge. Then join our Facebook group. It's called 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. That's 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. And post about what your 1000 challenge is and the progress you're making. All I ask is that people be encouraging of each other's challenges. This is personal and vulnerable, so be cool. There's enough negativity on social media. We don't need to add to it. For those of you who aren't on Facebook, hopefully in the future we'll be expanding to places like Discord, Reddit. But for now, we're starting on Facebook. And again, that Facebook group is called 1000 What's Your Challenge. See you there.